All right, so let's start with some introductions. Hi, my name is Kelly and I am the teacher for this course. Okay, so I am Andy. I'm the TA for this course. I am Nina. I am also a TA for this course. I'm Abby. I'm a student. I'm Isabel. I'm a student. Hi, I'm Nicholas. I'm also a student. I'm Cassie. I'm also a student. And I'm Patrick. I'm also a student. And maybe Thomas will join us later. Okay, um, so Nina, go ahead. Do you want to give us a summary of what we're talking about today? Yeah, today we're going to be talking about Rock and Riot, which is a webcomic by Chelsea Ferretti. It's about a bunch of teenagers in rival gangs in the 1950s and how they navigate love and their own identities and work together to have their own prom. So originally I had described this to you as a sort of um, Greece situation where it was Greece, but it was better because it was queer. And um, seems that that was not what we felt it was. Yeah, I didn't particularly agree with that comparison after reading Rock and Riot. Um, I personally do not like Greece very much. Um, the plot line kind of bothers me in a lot of ways. Um, but the main thing that I don't like about Greece that I was hoping would not be present in Rock and Riot, which I was glad was not present in Rock and Riot, was that nobody changed themselves to find love. You know what I mean? Because at the end of yeah. the day, Sandy kind of, she completely reinvents who she is so that she can be in a relationship that kind of fits the mold of what everything is supposed to look like. And I just thought that that was the exact opposite of what happened in Rock and Riot. And that was something I really loved. Yeah. yeah. And also that, that scene where, you know, they're trying to, they want to give Sandy a makeover, like in the beginning in that uh, sleepover piece. Mm -hmm. where like she's not like them and everyone's like boo-hoo Sandy you're not like us gets overshadowed by this moment where Roly Raleigh I'm not sure how you say Rolly. her name Roly is like has this moment where she's herself and she comes out in her dress and all of her friends accept and love her and it's so cute and nice. Mm -hmm. I would say the more apt comparison would be like Riverdale and like not like necessarily Ooh, that's an opinion in, not, always, <laughs> not always not always in like obviously like subject matter as like um we like discussed I think it was like two weeks ago with the comparing like the Betty and Veronica but I would just say more on like just the at least some of the older ones just like the some like the tongue tongue in cheek like wit um I don't know if those are the correct necessarily the right way to describe but just some of the tongue in cheek wit I was kind of like oh like there's a similar like vibe going on uh, that was just I will say that when I was saying, you know, Greece, I was more thinking rival gangs. They're all, you know, very like, I have to grease my hair. Um, we literally had a scene where they fell in the water and they were like, oh no, my hair, who has grease? Um, and opposing like that sort of, you know, star-crossed thing where it's a greaser and a non-greaser, especially because Carla has her really cute, sweet pink outfits <laughs> versus them and their jackets and stuff like that. There are definitely some parallels that you can make between, like, the aesthetic of the Maybe graphic novel. I haven't novel. seen Greece recently. <laughs> um, <laughs> so I'm not, I'm not completely against your comparison, but I just, as somebody who does not particularly enjoy Greece, I really liked Rock and Riot, so I don't want them to be <laughs> compared to each other. <laughs> kind of, well, I think something to point out is that I think the, I think, um, I think what um, Nicholas was tr starting to touch upon is that it wasn't, I don't feel like this comic takes place in the 1950s. It sort of takes place in the Archie Grease, like hyper reality of like the 1950s. And I think that like the 1950s are used more as an aesthetic than an actual commentary on them. Because even though racism is briefly touched upon, homophobia is definitely touched upon. It's touched upon in a way in which it's like, an obstacle that's solved through like hijinks or like some over the top like solution. It's not like, it's sort of, it's not like systematically dealt with. So it's more, it's like a cartoon version of what queer people went through in the 1950s, not like a accurate representation of it. Right, right. So we'll, maybe we'll touch a bit on that, on that later on the realism of the situation versus how the webcomic approaches it. 
Um, but, you know, we've all discussed how we don't like Grease, but we like Rock and Riot. Did, did everybody enjoy the webcomic? <laughs> Definitely. Yes. Well, an- another reason I actually enjoyed this and not Grease is that we touched upon consent, actually. <laughs> and the reason I bring that up is because, like, not only is, um, I'm sorry, it's been a while, uh, Gre- uh, Sandy, not only is Sandy pressured to change how she looks, but she's also pressured to have sex with Zuko. Like, she doesn't, like, she's kind of hesitant about it. She doesn't really want to dive in and everyone, like, pressures her to do it. And then she gives in at the end. We don't literally see it, but that's kind of metaphorically what's being represented. And what I like is that Rocket Riot has the very, uh, like, polar opposite position but on they, it. But they talk about, um, with multiple couples, right? Mm-hmm. So they, um, like, let's, really, let's talk about that scene. Because I actually wasn't expecting it. I had forgotten, um, since it's the second time around, that I had... Um, seen it um, but is this what's showing on screen right now yeah we're revealing mm-hmm. Nina's screen right now where they talk about it where um, he's clearly sort of ready to go at it and and so is um, Connie but um, both of their partners are like actually no I'm not really okay with that and I was pretty shocked and I was like this is really cute because then afterwards he's like is it okay if I give you a hug and he's like yeah that'd be fine and then it's adorable yeah, I really liked the, the way that this was dealt with um, in both instances, in both couples. And then we also get that beautiful moment with uh, Ace and Roly, where Ace is like, who identifies as aromantic and asexual, has like this like panic attack and literally jumps through a window, which is so funny. And the little the the fact that the window stays broken and like continues through the scene is really good. Um, just hilarious. But <laughs> the fact that like they have like a panic attack and they're like, I can't like someone. I don't like people. And um, oh, what's what, what's their name? Audrey. It's something E T T debt. Which is such, they have such fun names in this entire <laughs> comic. But debt is like, there can be exceptions. That's okay. Like, just be yourself and that's, that's enough and that's fine. And you can, like, and there are so many, like, I have, I have the, the list of characters pulled up that the author made. And it has all of their orientations. Uh, like, specifically, panromantic demisexual. Uh, gay, bi, homoromantic, gray asexual. Like, they're all figuring themselves out, and we see each and every one of those identities, like, come into their own, and it's all so consensually and respectfully dealt with, which is beautiful. Yeah, I think one of the benefits is that it's just very fluid in how it shows these characters, and showing that you're not just going to be at the finish line, you're not just going to automatically know who you are, that it's kind of a journey and it, you might think you found the right like label but like ace you might realize something else might fit or you might realize that something else has happened and that's okay because a lot of times it's like oh well um you said you were this so now you have to say that or now you're lying but the way this handles it is really nice i also really like that some characters like just didn't know they're like i know i'm different but i don't know you know what options are, what other things are that I could be, that there is a name for it. That's Mm -hmm. one thing that I really loved that the author touched on was that, so usually when we have stories, queer stories, it's centered around like one person or one couple, and then they're sort of in isolation and the rest of everybody else is straight. And they're sort of painted as like the different ones, like the token gay characters. But with this, we got to see so many different queer people and queer couples that were different in their expressions. But we got that representation in multiple ways, which I thought was really great. I also think it was uh, great and kind of subtle that it's more or less a romantic comic with romantic couples that go through hijinks. And yet, and all culminating in prom, and yet there's two asexual characters. Actually, I might have miscounted, but the point is, is that it's not, they're not excluded from the um, group. They're not, it's not like, oh, they then figure out that their asexuality is fake and find someone at prom. They're just allowed to be who they are. 
and they're part of the group and they're part of the story, even though they don't quite fit into the overarching theme. Yeah, that's some. Oh, uh, you go. No, you can go. It's fine. It's yeah. fine. Go. Okay. I was just gonna say, like, just building off what um what Patrick just said that like the way they like they didn't like like yeah they focused like a lot on like all the like exploring of sexuality sexuality but at the same time they do they weren't like making like big deals out of it they were just like you know like um they would i don't know they just weren't like blowing out of like i remember i don't know if any of you saw bohemian rhapsody like suppose it two years ago there's a scene where like um freddie mercury like like comes out but it's like so it's like handled so like i don't know like they like it, it's like really like exaggerated and it's like he doesn't even like say he's gay he just thinks like he says i think i'm bi and then his girlfriend is like no you're gay and i don't know it's just like in comparison comparing how they like treated it then to this i don't know it's just i appreciate that it was just like like everyone just rolled with it like as everyone should like it doesn't make you any different right i thought it was very sweet and i, I did to bring up the the things that isabel was talking about with their all their identifications. So we have Ed, who's asexual and aromantic, and then Ace, who's asexual and demiromantic, as he, as they realize um, later into the comic. Um, but yeah, I like, I like how they rolled with it too. I do have to say, I loved at that one scene when they're like all coming out and they're all like in relationships and stuff. And then Ed was just like, I don't like anyone. And it's like, that was fine because I feel with a lot of these stories there's a huge focus on having to be in a relationship and like asexual or yes asexual individuals can be in relationships it's and they do show that but i like that inclusion of the aromantic and like you really just don't have to be in a relationship and like you know i just i laughed so hard at that and i felt <laughs> that like so deep inside because it's like even when everybody else is in these relationships like you know there's at least like they're showing that somebody doesn't have to be in a relationship um no matter like even little like away from the whole aromantic asexual orientation like it just doesn't have to be someone in a relationship one thing that did upset me uh, not upset me but um did, i don't remember maybe i'm remembering this incorrectly but did he go to prom with them at, yeah he did go he Edward. did okay and he just was chilling they it was just the final scene too. Was he okay? Never mind then, because I was gonna say I wish that they like showed that like you didn't really have you don't have to go to prom. Um, it's of course it's okay to go to prom like by yourself and like with your friends and stuff. But also I felt like there was a little bit too much of it. I don't know. Maybe this was just my opinion because also I have feelings about prom and everything. No, I feel that um, I hated prom. I felt like it was kind Damn. of like you have to go to prom and like I know that the big part of them going to prom was like we're queer and we're going to show it and we're not afraid to like go into this binary like event that people think has to be like a boy and a girl going together um and that was a really big part and that was really great but I also felt like there was a little bit too much emphasis on like that they had to go um at least that's just, just how I read it that's a really good point and there's a little there's a little piece of the cuts did you did you see the little cutscenes in between um, like right before the prom thing where they're like you see the different artists drawing them in their yeah. like, prom outfits and there's Ed is in it with um, a news clipping yeah he he's, says, he's got like his hat pulled down and he yeah Andy Andy do you have it I don't know yeah you know. he says um, he says prom is for squares but I'm here to support the gang basically so he wouldn't have gone probably is, mm -hmm. is sort of what we were led to believe, but he's there for his friends. And so he'll go to support them um, to okay. make it. I forgot what that said. I remember I saw that part and I was like, yeah, <laughs> <laughs> he was just by himself. Like he was just chilling. And I love that so much. Yeah, I, I really liked Ed too, especially because I think it was Ed and um, Isabel, who was the other character that you brought up earlier? Um, Dead. That Ed and, and Dad were the ones who didn't have dates, and I think that might also be um, Ace or Arrow. Um, yeah, I think they're hold on, gender fluid, asexual, aromantic. Yeah. Yeah, and also I really liked that even in their coming out scene, which was the best. What a coming out scene! Um, <laughs> the fact that they're like, "Does anybody else have any like anybody else?" And he was like, "I don't like anyone." Was even 
I felt like a very inclusive thing. Cause there's, there's always a conversation about whether being asexual is being part of the um, LGBTQ plus spectrum. Um, so I also felt like it was a nice inclusion where it was, it was acknowledging like, yeah, it's, it's also them coming out in a way um, and being part of the community and not just being the one who doesn't like people like that. <laughs> yeah, no, it's super validating to have that, like to, ha- to have him be like, this is how I feel and have everyone else be like, oh, that's an important thing for us to know and we take it seriously. And that was part of this discussion. Like that's really huge. I also liked the chaos of that scene when, yeah. I, um, when, he, when the, the jock, I think his, his name is Frank, when he was like, I've been dating like the jock in my class. He's like, I didn't have to keep it a secret. And he's like crying and all snotty. It was great. <laughs> I guess also just along with everything we've been talking about going into like the ace um, representation, I loved so much just the fact that there was a third gang um, and it wasn't that there was like the asexuals were with the bi, like, you know, you could see them as like the binary in a way. And then they had the separate gang of like um, the gender fluid and the agender who are like, I don't know their exact, um, like how exactly they identified, but it was clear that they were just, you know, outside of that binary. And I love that they made a separate group. It wasn't that they were within the two groups. It was just like, we're another category and that's okay. Um, I love that that was like its own thing. Um, And that obviously added to the representation of um, sexuality and gender. Yeah, I hadn't thought about it like that, of this group sort of being like these two binaries that Ace is like fighting to remove themselves from. And then this whole third window opening up, they they already belong to and they're like no I'm not interested in in your guys's. It was also really nice that um, when the bandits like come on to the scene it's not like they somehow like mediate and solve the like sexism and all of the the, like uh, toxic masculinity that's existing between these two binary groups but they have to solve it on their own and that um what's her name, that Rolly is like, there's that suit where she's like, I'm always right. <laughs> she's like, <laughs> she's like, I know you guys are being a pain, but it's like, they have to like, figure it out. And it's not like they're like, the bandits have already figured themselves out. And they're not there to like, solve anything or to like, match them together or to like, get rid of gender, but that like, it does and does not exist in all these different ways. I don't know, I thought it was really cool. You wanna peek at our, our list, Nina? Sure, I know I'm really interested in talking about the ending, cause I know at first I didn't feel satisfied about it because I was kind of confused if they were like, if they did make a difference at prom because there's the one scene um, where they like crash through the building and then all the couples who were like in like straight heterosexual typical couples switch and they went to who they really wanted to be with but then the main characters weren't at the prom um like they all left and went and did their own thing so I wasn't sure if like it was a happy ending or if it was like a kind of happy if they got what they wanted or didn't and so I was kind of interested to hear what you all thought about that on one hand I can understand them leaving because I guess the idea is that they couldn't um they couldn't stay because they had already disrupted everything. So like the school or staff or someone would have kicked it out. So it was more of like the gesture of going and not caring, but logistically having to get out of there. But I feel like the scene was already so over the top already with them literally like driving a car through the school and nearly taking off the, you know, sexist or uh, homophobic woman's like head off with the back tire. Like, it's already so over the top. Why not just have it be like, and then everyone was queer and then everyone got with who they wanted to actually be. And then they stayed at the prom. Like, why not just kind of go for that sort of like fantastic ending? Cause it was already kind of in that realm already. And kind of what I was alluding to earlier with sort of like, this doesn't feel like it takes place in the real 1950s. It takes place in like a hyper aesthetic 1950s like I'd say you don't have to confer you don't have to conform to sort of realism you can just sort of have a happily ever after ending which it kind of already was but you could have also made it more perfect with them staying at the prom what I like about this um even though it isn't like a 
like a sugar-coated like happy ending they do riot like they you mentioned like they do switch like all of the main character the other um characters that are in the prom already that were like that like snuck in with their like opposite gender like partners and were like ha 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 no one will find us um they do switch and yeah, and uh, which is a really cute scene. And it's, I think that like they created the disturbance and that was their point and that they went to prom and they were like, we're here, uh, we're queer and we're, mm. we're taking pictures and we're getting snacks and then we're leaving because you guys are lame. And the fact that they go and have their own moment outside of the prom, I thought was really sweet and important because having the, the prom not be accepting of them was kind of this little moment of realism where it was like sometimes there will be structures that don't accept you but the entire comic was about community and like fighting within community but then building and strengthening that community and keeping it no matter what other issues were around and like banding together against something like this and so I thought having them be um like alone and on the on the hill in the woods or wherever they are was was nice in that way because it was community fo focused, even though it, it isn't as happy an ending as it could have been. And honestly, I liked that in the beginning, um, Nina, if you go to like the second slide of this PowerPoint, um, they actually did hint at the fact that everybody here is actually pretty queer. Okay, maybe it's not the second one, maybe it's the first one. Other direction. There we go. Oh, maybe I didn't even put it in here. That's fine. Where there was a moment where they first arrived and um, when they first arrive, it's not in here, Nina, it's okay. Um, and Connie gets out of the car and she like does her little like finger guns and the entire crowd has like hard eyes and stuff like that, where there's a lot of those traces where everybody is attracted to whoever is like the bad boy of the situation or bad girl or bad you know, in between or whatever, um, where they're just all sort of have these, these similar like attractions and stuff like that, um, that sort of led into that prom scene. Um, and so I really liked that. It was, I especially liked that picture of one of the students um, having hidden their, their, their suit underneath their dress. And so you just throw off the skirt and they're actually already wearing a suit. Um, but I really, I liked the ending scene, similar to what Isabel said. I think it was sort of a show of their rioting and their sort of, nat their natural state is to break the rules. And so in this as well, they were also breaking the rules by enjoying prom the way that they could and then going to actually celebrate themselves. I think that also speaks to sort of what Cassie, you were talking about earlier, about how like not everybody has to want to go the prom like it's more about just the idea that they weren't allowed so they rioted about it and then actually went and did what they wanted to do you put it better than what I, how I could explain it <laughs> that's exactly what I was trying to say earlier <laughs> whose outfit was your favorite <laughs> <Rollies>. <laughs> At the prom specifically or prom specifically can you pull the outfits out the Sorry. real questions <laughs> you're to ask them that and who well i'm curious to know what couple y'all liked the best as i really like mm -hmm. um actually, i actually don't remember the one girl's name it's tris and her girlfriend oh the ones who were like we were dating in secret this whole time mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. debbie and tris yeah she's like Tris is like super tall and then Debbie's like half her size and she wears like a tux <laughs> top with a skirt. Yeah, they're so cute. I think they're my favorite. Like, I think Tris's outfit was yeah. my favorite. I feel like this image sums up the energy of the comic. Like, <laughs> like what chaotic energy, like, like it's just unfolding. Like it's awesome at the same time. I think Frank and Sasha, the soccer player, are my favorite. Just because I was, it was so unexpected and they were so funny. <laughs> I love that Sasha was like, kind of like, usually that token character is a woman, but to have Sasha be like the love interest that like sidles up to the gang is like, I heard this was ha that so and so <laughs> wanted to meet with you. I was like, that's the line that's given <laughs> to the female that's not important in the movie. And I was like, oh my God. But like, 
but Sasha is so sweet and you have Frankie just loves him so much with them. Well, I was kind of hoping to get a picture at prom and Frankie's like, we'll do it. We're going to do it. <laughs> and it was just adorable. It's so I hard also, to pick a favorite uh, couple. The two asexuals, uh, I think <laughs> that is the, their expressions are the most asexual I've ever seen. Yeah, it's do a lot of fist bumping. Yeah, look yeah. the foot up. <laughs> that fedora. Especially dead on the top. I'm really partial to uh, Connie and... Oh, what's her name? Clara. Ah, Connie Carla. and Clara. Carla. 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 Uh, Carla. Just because I think Sorry. their relationship is right so cute. <laughs> uh, they're just two very different people, but they work really well together. I think when Connie, like, like, falls over on the tree and is, like, annoyed, <laughs> and then the sign is upside down because Carla anticipated that, I was like, that's the cutest thing I've ever seen. I'm all set. I'm all done. Thank you. I really like that Sunny um, is also flashing as well as Frankie in the background. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't even notice. <laughs> very cute. Very wholesome. One of the things that I was actually curious about is, is like we've talked about a lot of content this semester and even just thinking about um, that New Warriors comic that came out and how inappropriate it was and looking at this and, and how this is like super fun and exciting, like it's so different to see who's writing the content and who they're writing it for and how that changes like what comes out. Like obviously this isn't about superheroes um, and it, it isn't about, you know, trying to reclaim words or anything like that, but it isn't an effective queer content, you know, that is for younger um than like 30 audiences, you know what I mean? Um, and that's sort of what the New Warriors was supposed to be. And I just think it's really interesting those differences in getting a message across. I'm gonna log off in a minute, but I think that's a really important point. And one of the things I was wondering is like, how would this have looked different if a writer from the Colbert show had written this instead of, uh, instead of a young woman who I think identifies as like a part of this community? Um, yeah, how would that, how would that have changed this? Bad. Just bad. Yeah, New Warriors was already bad, so I feel like the answer is probably yeah. bad across the board, but... Probably you wouldn't have, have probably the asexuals would be non-existent, or they would figure out That's that true. their asexuality wasn't real by the end of prom. Yeah, I think it's, it's very important, the question of who's creating the content. Um, because not only do we need these characters, but we need these writers because we need these authentic stories. If some 50-year-old white man who's straight from the Colbert, Colbert show is writing content for a young LGBTQ community, it's not going to come out as well as it could come out, even if he does it correctly. You know what I mean? Because he hasn't uh -huh. lived that. Yeah, we need writers who are part of the communities that they're writing about, and it clearly shines through. When absolutely, happens. yeah, yeah. I feel like you could tell when like they're doing it for the sake of like, oh, so we can say like we have one. When compared to the sake of someone just genuinely just writing, like there's just like, um, I've just seen like areas where they're like, oh, like what do you know, like. There's a gay character here like hey like do you see what we do we get diversity points for that but then um i don't know there's just a, like i said earlier like it's just they made it like in rock and ride just subtle and genuine and just like it's not forced they're just writing as it is writing as it how it is and like i just like i appreciate that more than just someone trying to score points with an audience and failing <laughs> Yeah, you can definitely feel when an author is just trying to pander to young folks rather than just trying to be like authentic and tell a story. Uh, and that really sets back a lot of stories because they're trying so hard when really it's not a hard thing to do. Yeah. One of the things that I that I really noticed with that is like even at the end of this comic, um, the artist Chelsea put a note at the end. Um, thanking everybody who had been you know reading the comic but also uh, in she says 
Over the last year since the time I posted the first page in this time I have learned so much and I'm so excited to use that knowledge to create a new story. And so I think it has this implication that she um, probably didn't have all this knowledge to start with as well. Like she might be part of the LGBTQ community and have, you know, um, have that kind of thing to back her up in, in the heart and authenticity of this story. But I think there's also like a giant learning curve that the author had to take in creating all of these really diverse characters who were just super cool and really fun to read. And I think that's part of the, um, the answer is to like, to not only, you know, be a part of these communities, but also to take the time to learn and incorporate and listen to other people in their stories so that you can reflect them better. Which I thought was really cool. It's that willingness to learn and grow. That's really important as well. Yeah. And also understanding that like, there's a difference between having like a token character who you're pushing to talk about their issues when you don't know about them versus having a diverse range of characters that may not touch on those issues, which is to say that like things can be diverse without overreaching and going into the wrong stories. Like if you, and if you are going to tell those sorts of stories like Chelsea did, you need to reach out to a community who's going to help you do it because you can't do it on your own. If anyone's curious, I, I just thought up the St the Colbert version of Rock and Riot. <laughs> okay, let's hear it. I'm scared. Okay, so <laughs> basically, remember that entire like character sheet that laid out like their orientation and everything. Yeah. Basically, non-existent. Uh, Connie and I forget the other is the only couple. Uh, they aren't together for the whole series. It's just teased, and it's only in the very last issue that they romantically hold hands <laughs> <laughs> and, the, and then if you look in the background some of the other characters are dancing together and if you if you technically match who's matched with who we've actually checked all the boxes so we just diversity points <laughs> but but we also have a straight couple that gets most of the screen time they're like the b couple but they come on screen more often yes also, there That's is accurate. People, like plus size or people of color mostly. No, 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 no. <laughs> no, we that's just overstepping. Maybe, the maybe we can put it in the background, but not not the main characters though. Okay. Not part nobody's of the short. Nobody's tall. They all look no, the same. No, everyone's like very like. Who was uh, born five five? <laughs> that's it. Everyone looks like they walked out of a Life magazine from the nineteen fifties. Very all very attractive. Yep. Goodness. We got to be historically accurate to what people looked like in the 1950s. Every <laughs> single person. There were no short people in the 1950s. No, there were no short people. Th those are a recent development. <laughs> short people were invented in 1998. <laughs> yes. They're new. I can see you know your history very well. I mean, we're all joking about it, but for sure, Rock and Riot has oh, so much diversity, both in like absolutely body does. size. Like we have actual fat characters who are just yeah. like really interesting and awesome. We have characters of lots of different races, and like we actually see like the Ace talking in Spanish with his mom about like his yes! illegal homework business, <laughs> and it's just like really that cute. Was such and, a good scene. Yeah. <laughs> it was. No, really when was. when their mom came in with like the cross necklace, I was like, oh no, are they gonna get busted? And then they were like, hi mom. <laughs> I was like, this is really nice. <laughs> oh, okay, we can just have something nice. Yeah, that's great. Also, I love that for like the descriptions with all the characters for, is it Con Connie? Connie? Connie, yes. Um, she is a plus size character and they list her as like one of her things is confident. And I, lo I just love that. Mm -hmm. It's like the little things like that, um, that just, I don't know. I just love the diversity in this because it's not just sexuality and gender and whatever. It's so much more than that. It's people. It's actually It's people. people. <laughs> it's real <Love> people. That. <laughs> So cool. Okay, we should start wrapping up because it's two o'clock. Did you guys have any final thoughts? I'm glad you all enjoyed it, this not Greece experience. <laughs> um, I'd, I'd say that kind of like, um, uh, as someone who hasn't really read a lot of web comics and kind of mostly just gets the regular output of DC and Marvel, I'm like glad I got the opportunity to read something I probably would not have otherwise read on my own. I was glad to have the opportunity to read it a second time. I'm a little spoiled like that, but it was, um, <laughs> it, it, 
reading it now when I have um, a better idea of sort of what to look for in representation. And I say that in like, sometimes you, you read or watch things and you're like, oh, I'm, I'm represented. Why do I feel uncomfortable though? Um, versus, you know, reading this and just being like, this is a good time. <laughs> this was bomb for a troubled soul. Like this was just nice to read. It was really good. Oh, I kind of have one question. Uh, if it's quick. Um, I keep, I keep like bringing up the subject of like hyper 1950s, like kind of hyper reality. Um, do you kind of see it that way or do you kind of disagree with me? Cause it's like, even though there's homophobia in this world, it's sort of like, it still seems like the politics and the way it's handled is very modern to, and even though obviously conceptions of homosexuality are thousands of years old, like the exact precision and like sort of modern, like uh, pinpoint accuracy on which uh, dis, um, orientation everyone is kind of seems very modern. I think- And personally... I don't think there's anything wrong with that. I just sort of feel like it's kind of like a hyper reality. Right, I think the creator um, was sort of, and obviously I can't speak for her, but just sort of this idea that you can create content in a time that you think is cool. And while it's not, um, you have the opportunity when you're creating something new to get rid of whatever you want. Um, but this creator specifically decided that, you know, I'm not going to make this the biggest thing. Like the, the problem is going to be them at prom. It's not going to be that Connie is not allowed into certain um, places. And it's not going to be that Carla's dad finds out and that they're all subjected to horrible um, difficult situations. Um, and so I really liked that she didn't completely remove it from the situation because it sort of was still like, these are still problems. I'm not ignoring them, but we're not going to make them the central theme and it's going to be okay. Um, I like stories about queer characters or having queer characters where the end is, it's going to be okay. I yeah, agree. that makes a lot of sense. Mm -hmm. I think with Riverdale and things, shows like that, it's done for the aesthetic, whereas this was done for a purpose, like a, like a story-based purpose. Like I, I agree with Andy there that it was, which is why I, why I see it differently. I don't know if that makes sense. Or if that, yeah. Yeah, no, that, yeah. that makes perfect sense. Yeah, there's like way too many sad queer stories out there and a lot of people feel really restricted by time and where they can't write stories about the 1950s or 1920s without including like lots of really sad homophobia and stuff. And so I think it's really brilliant that she took some modern things and applied it to the 1950s because we still get to see queer people in big like pink uh, poodle skirts and uh, queer people in gangs and all that really cool stuff that we don't usually get to see. And she gets to do it in such a way that it's cute and wholesome and you feel good at the end rather than just being really sad because of all the shit that happens because of realism yeah and it does have realism like people today are still not like queer people today are still not allowed to go to proms and stuff but the way that it's handled is just very nice and it's very refreshing it's, so you, you'd probably also say it strikes that balance of kind of presenting an ideal world uh but if they had not addressed like homophobia then it would sort of be like revisionist history so by partially addressing it but not obsessing over it you kind of have that perfect balance yeah and i mean even if she hadn't included any of that i still would have read it and loved it um because i don't know i think part of the freedom in making a web comic is that you don't have to abide by any rules and so you aren't expected by your audience to include things like that. If you decide on an aesthetic and then you put a story, your audience is going to be happy. Um, there, I, I, I haven't seen a lot of stress from webcomic artists to always be, you know, like the historical accuracy or like societal accuracy or things like that. Like, I don't know, even in things like Game of Thrones and things like that, where they're like, oh, well, the reason why all the women are horribly abused is because women's rights didn't exist and I'm like this is a fantasy world nothing exists nothing's real so you can do what you want with it and so similarly on a whole different knob um, webcomic artists like Chelsea are just like I can do whatever I want with it and this is what I want to do with it 
when given the template of a completely fantasy world where anything can happen, why write about the same tragic things that are happening all the time? Why not write a happy queer love story? This has been a blast. Thank you, everyone. You did absolutely fantastic. I think Nina's going to hit the stop on the record button now. You want to say like a goodbye or a sign off or anything, maybe? <laughs> or should I just click it? Like and subscribe. I mean, I don't, don't know. Forget like, like, yeah, don't forget to yeah, like and subscribe. We don't have, we don't have a below. like or a subscribe Smash button. There's like not button. a comment section. <laughs> I don't know, just like, a, all right, everyone, thanks for listening to our first GNAB podcast. Bye. Yeah, okay. There you go. There you go. <laughs> there you go. That was perfect. Thank you for listening. Bye. Everybody wave. Bye. Bye. Bye.